I grew up in New Zealand. Uh, my ethnic origin is Samoan, and both my parents were Samoan. And I was raised in South Auckland um, by an adopted parents. Um, father was French and the mother was Samoan, so I ended up with a French last name. And um, through that upbringing, uh, I, uh, when I was about 14, they split up and um, they told me I was adopted at that time as well. And it was all a bit of a shock. And that shock sort of sent me into a like, very deep depression and um, shattered my life pretty much. I ended up on the street as a result and I had to figure out how to survive from 14. At that time, I was pretty innocent. Like I, all I knew was you gotta get a job. So I went to try and get a job, but being that young, it, um, you can't, it's not easy to find a job because you're underage. You're under a like, legal working age, but I still needed an income. So I had no choice but to get involved in illegal activities, crime, different types of crime to try and keep myself afloat, yeah. So I was, I was involved with um, you know, friends who were in the wrong, you know, uh, negative, they were negative friends. And, um, and then it moved from cars, cars wasn't enough after a while. And then we moved into houses and started doing, breaking into houses. And, in the night time, day time, you know, where people at home, people not home, didn't really matter. So, um, and that just went into, you know, I was still going to school actually at that time. I'd just jump the fence at lunchtime, go break into a house and then jump the fence back and before the bell rings and back into class. And uh, it started off with one house a day and then it moved to two, three, four, and then we got to five houses a day, I had to quit school. So I ended up down that path, um, uh, breaking into houses and, and then that, just grew, you know, from houses, it went to shops, and shops into shopping malls even, um, banks, casinos, factories, you know, it just, it just kept going. And uh, full time, I was doing it, seven days a week, uh, from 14 years old, 15, 16, 17, 18. And when I got to 19, I was doing um, counterfeit money, credit cards. Was that a life career? It, it was, it was. Because that's all I knew at the time, you know. So the level of crime was, was a little bit different. It was a more professional sort of level. You know, uh, street crime now is corporate. And we were doing um, counterfeit credit cards. I was counterfeiting passports. Well, uh, that was the peak of the criminal career. And at that point, I also made a, a huge mistake in, in trusting somebody that... Uh, I thought I could trust, couldn't trust. That person went to the police. The police went to Interpol, Interpol came and um, shut down our operation pretty much. Uh, like, you know, sealed off the suburb and zoned in and pushed me into a corner and, um, and arrested me and I went to jail. Pretty much by that time, all my friends were already in jail. So I wasn't really that scared because I, I had friends there. But what I was scared of was, um, some of the activities that go on inside the prison. There's more drugs, there's more abuse. It's, it's definitely um, not a rehabilitation place. It's not somewhere where you go to get rehabilitated. Worse. Yeah, you'll come out much worse. And yeah. So what happened after you did your, your six months? What happened after that? Uh, well, I, just, I changed my whole living environment and I relocated myself to a different place inside Auckland, but on the other side of the city and I tried to start my life again. Because I, when you come out of prison at 19 years old, with no education record, so, so you, no job history, no rental history, no um, identification, no birth certificate, no family. I was adopted, they'd only told me that when I was 14. I didn't even know who my parents were. But I had nothing, nothing really to, no income source. Legally, like no legal way of getting into the system and, and getting support. And so I had to clean up, so I did, did a, like a life improvement course in that, in that subject, and which was like 50 bucks and I had that money, so I did the course, cleaned up all the years, all the transgressions and wrongdoings, like a confessional almost, 
but on paper, you know, I, it was part of the course. So um, after doing that, uh, one of the recommendations for me was to go to the police station and hand in a lot of the, the crimes that I'd, that I'd written out, the ones that the police hadn't caught me for. It, it is good to get it out of the way, but, you know, I was already... How did that go? Is that scary? Yeah, yeah, because, you know, they, they tried to get me for 15 years for one crime, and I walked in there with 975 that they didn't know about and handed those over. And that was uh, basically saying, you know, give me a life sentence because that, that's what it would add up to. But, you know, that, it required the biggest uh, courage to go into a police station and say, here's a crime. Here's a crime that I committed. Very, very courageous, very brave. Yeah, that was the toughest part. Well, the mentors that, that I was working with at the time said to me to, um, to offer community service to the police as a sentence, a self-sentence. So I rang them and told them I'd do community service and they, they said, yeah, go for it. So I, I did that. I started um, working voluntarily in this community because the idea was getting it all off my chest was one thing, but you have to make up the damage somehow. So I, I started volunteering in, in, um, for different community groups, going into prisons. They were teaching me how to mentor other youth, um, drug rehabs, literacy programs for schools, counselling, all kinds of stuff. So I did that full time for 12 months. So, but I was enjoying it because that, it gave me a purpose. Because when I started helping other kids who were going down the same path, and then I would talk to them and say, you know, you guys aren't listening to your teachers, but let me tell you where you're headed, you know, and I'll be able to engage with them. I mean, I was, I was already, I was doing so much um, positive in, um, you know, impact, uh, influence in New Zealand, but it was, it was capped. Like, there was a lot that I couldn't do, and coming to Australia was a way of expanding that. So I came here, and I continued my community work, and after some time of experiencing, of working with so many different communities here, I worked out that uh, you know, the, the main thing that would help the community here is the knowledge of how to become uh, self-sustainable. So I developed new civilization builders and working in many different communities. And I have 32 different projects running across um, many communities. What's the most important ones, the ones that you really feel um, that are most important? Like just mention a few of the most important ones that you think. Uh, youth and business which is probably the most important, top priority, because that's the one that will fix everything. As soon as the entrepreneur mindset kicks in, then the student, will, then the young person will solve all his own problems going forward. Um, that one is the most important one. Uh, that one is one that changes, turns the tide. The, the another pro project that, work, that is uh, also very successful is called Domestic Respect. It's uh, to teach women how to become um, how to stand up to domestic violence and or being bullied. So it, it teaches them or gives them courage through self-defense lessons and also teaches them how to read people so they don't get involved with the wrong people in the first place. Um, I have another one called Bounce Back, which is a program where we, we take uh, the African and the Pacific Island kids off the streets, the gang members, and we put them into a, um, a, like a boot camp but we use basketball as the sport, fitness, and we mentor them and combine those. The message I would give them is to, um, to always, you know, to always uh, realize that there is a solution to every single problem out there. And it doesn't matter what they might run into as a problem, uh, there is a solution and, and generally, um, if you're finding it hard to solve a problem, then you have to change the way you think. Because sometimes the thinking that designs, the thinking that's used to build the system that you're trying to fix is not, you can't use the same thinking to solve the problem. You have to change something. So, so don't give up. Because they, when they run out of options, they give up. But the, if you just keep pushing, you find 100% of the time, you'll find a way just never give up.